All right, recording has started and we're off and running. Welcome everyone. Here we are in March already, springtime. Um, I'm just gonna start going through. Oh, uh, happy St. Patrick's Day, uh, sh sh Shamrock Clover Day. Um, if, if we had a bigger screen, this could be a fun activity, but there are multiple four leaf clovers in this picture here. You might be able to find the one prominent one, but there are, there are I think, five four leaf clovers in that patch. Here's the, here's the most prominent one. And then there's one here and one here um, and one here. And I, 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 oh, and one here, a small, a small leaf one. <laughs> so anyway, um, four leafers do sometimes occur in patches and apparently they're influenced by temperature. Warmer temperatures make for uh, more four leaves if I read that um, correctly. So anyway, um, and Edie's already got a question on on chloride. All right, we'll get to that. Edie, bring that up when we get to the chloride survey updates. Um, all right. So happy St. Patty's Day. Um, as I mentioned, this meeting is being recorded. So just uh, stay on mute unless you're going to be asking a question. And um, these recordings are available. All of them are stored at this site, which has lots of other resources but every monthly meeting recording is there. So feel free to access those. Um, these meetings are every third Thursday of the month, always 2.30 to 3.30 in the afternoon. And this is the same Zoom link every time. So uh, feel free to keep that for your records and just use that every third Thursday of the month. Uh, <clears throat> I do send a, a reminder email uh, a week prior to this meeting and then on the morning of. Um, whoever, anyone's welcome to attend, so feel free to share the Zoom link with folks and the uh, emails. And do please uh, let us know if there is anyone that you know of that is not getting those emails but would like to receive those and we'll add them to the email distribution list. Um, <clears throat> just as a reminder, Groups that are attending these meetings include folks working in the uh, Delaware River Watershed Initiative specifically. That's where um, most of the funding for this work is coming from for the Stroud Center. Um, certainly a lot of groups that aren't working directly in the DRWI, but that are uh, within the Delaware Basin are attending these and working with Enviro DIY monitoring stations and doing other monitoring as well. And then there are folks that are attending the meetings from outside the DRB for, for just general reference on Enviro DIY um, stuff. Um, as I mentioned, we're uh, supporting this effort with DRWI as well as Seesaw for uh, groups in, the, uh, in Pennsylvania, Consortium for Scientific Assistance to Watersheds. Here's the website for the Delaware River Watershed Initiative, four states, one source.org. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot more going on in the DRWI than just this um, continuous monitoring with these stations. Lots of uh, groups involved doing lots of different monitoring um, and, and protection and restoration work. And then Seesaw, there's the website, c-saw.info. Um, this is available to groups that are working in Pennsylvania that may not be associated with the RWI. Stroud Center can provide assistance uh, with those funds as well. So feel free to reach out if you're one of those types of groups and you need um, you know, more substantial assistance. That is more than just an hour or two. So the, the, these meetings are... Um, just a time for us all to check in and for Stroud Center to provide uh, key updates. And then we have presentations from um, either from station owners and managers on their uh, local work that they're doing uh, and from um, on specific topics, technical and ecological from um, 
from experts and others um, from Stroud Center and elsewhere. And all of this is certainly just to uh, help with producing good data um, for, uh, to use uh, for, for specific purposes. Um, <clears throat> so Stroud Center facilitators, me, Rachel Johnson, who is uh, out in the field right now and in her car going to do uh, assistance on some stations as usual. Uh, Krista Reeves, who's with the Musconet Kong Watershed Association and also works with um, Stroud Center as a tech technician for the uh, northern part of the um, Delaware Basin. And then Shannon Hicks, who is the engineer, um, <clears throat> really the source of knowledge for all of this technical stuff. She is the inventor and designer of the Mayfly data loggers and these Enviro DIY monitoring stations. And then we've got uh, Master Watershed Stewards broadly involved with this effort. Um, we're help, helping support a lot of groups with a lot of these stations. Um, two folks that are working directly with the Stroud Center uh, are Carol Armstrong and George Seeds. They are available for mentoring if any folks um, you know, need kind of on-site guidance. And then Stroud Center leads on, in the DRWI context, uh, Dr. John Jackson, um, he's a bug guy, Matt Earhart, restoration guy, and Dave R. Scott, who's the executive director at the Stroud Center. Um, <clears throat> so Enviro DIY in the DRB, uh, from the Stroud Center's perspective, our primary goal is to just support uh, station owners and managers and the volunteers that are supporting these stations and using the stations for their own purposes, their own local purposes. Secondarily, the Stroud Center is doing um, uh, basin-wide analysis of the data set and developing tools to help with data interpretation and um, contextualization uh, within watersheds. Uh, Diana Oviedo Vargas, uh, Stroud researcher, is going to be presenting next month on some of this type of work. So tune in for that next month. And moving on to today's agenda, um, I'm going to provide just a few updates and then uh, we'll get into survey results for these various surveys that have gone on the SITSI and monitoring terminology survey the tap water, uh, salt and tap water survey, and then a uh, winter storm grab sample salt survey that uh, a subset of groups in the DRB have been uh, contributing to this winter. And then Shannon, um, again, this month is gonna provide some technology updates. And then we should, I think we should have some time for discussion after all that is through. So updates, um, just a reminder that if you have um, any problems with your stations and you would like some uh, direct assistance from the Stroud Center, if it's assistance that uh, looks like it's gonna be uh, in person, um, please feel uh, free to fill out this service request form. You can find it on this webpage. It has a section of its own with, uh, in this web page, so it should be easy to find. It'll just ask you to fill out a few uh, bits of information about uh, what your station is um, experiencing, some kind of just basic uh, information that will help us, primarily uh, Shannon and Rachel, um, troubleshoot the issue from afar and then decide what needs to happen and if um, a uh, in-person visit is necessary. So. Feel free to use that form. And just a reminder that this website, where that form is located, has a wide variety of um, other resources there. You can find this, this website just at wikiwatershed.org as well, and clicking this DRWI tab. But there's all kinds of resources, um, such as you, know, you can access field visit data sheets. Um, you can access workshops and conferences. There's a lot of other guidance materials in there. You can access the manual and quick guides and video resources. So um, even if you're not necessarily needing something right now, it's probably it, 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 just for your 
frame of reference, it's probably good to just go to that website and click on things and check things out and just kind of calibrate yourself to what's available. And, um, you know, and feel free to be in touch if there's anything that, that um, you know, you think should be there that isn't, because uh, it's certainly possible that we're missing something and we're always updating that with, with new and uh, with new materials that are going to be helpful for folks. So feel free to be in touch um, about that site and about the resources that are there. Okay, uh, any questions before we move on? Let's see, there's... Oh, Al, thank you. Year is incorrect on the first slide. Yes, we have moved to 2022. Thanks. I almost forgot to change the month on that too. I changed the month and forgot the year. Um, okay, thanks, Al. Okay, so um, let's move on. Okay, so I'm gonna pre present some results on this citizen science and monitoring terminology survey we did, and then I'll move into the tap water uh, results, salt and tap water results, and then I'll get into these uh, salt crab sample results. Very uh, incomplete. A lot, most of those samples are still being processed, but we'll show a few of the preliminary initial results. So here are the questions um, <clears throat> that we had for the this uh, uh, CSI, we're calling it, because we'll get into why. But um, uh, this was a uh, uh, survey that really we. we some folks clearly based on the response in the survey are tuned in to some of these questions about terminology regarding citizen science or community science or volunteer monitoring or any number of other terms that folks are using to describe um, professional plus non-professional science work. So these are the four questions we had in that survey. Um, what words and phrasing do you currently use when referring to the continuous monitoring stations that are distributed throughout the Delaware River Basin? So this is um, asking about the Enviro DIY stations and how people refer to, to those, what question or what terminology folks use when referring to those, Mayfly, Enviro DIY, continuous data, so on. Do you have suggestions for what this group of stations and other monitoring activities could be called? So this was a question uh, that's kind of was intended to help uh, us kind of move forward with our, uh, that is the Stroud Center's um, formalizing some of these terms, or at least uh, starting to think about formalizing some of these terms. Um, Next question, what words and phrasing do you currently use in referring to watershed monitoring efforts done by watershed groups and volunteers? And then final question, if you had your choice, what do you think is the best, most descriptive terminology to describe citizen slash community slash volunteer slash public monitoring efforts? So this is all getting at um, terminology used for the continuous stations and terminology used for general monitoring efforts and trying to move forward with terms that are descriptive but not overly burdensome or cumbersome. And that is quite challenging. And there's lots and lots of uh, peer reviewed papers in uh, science journals and specifically citizen science or community science journals that go back and forth on, um, on uh, terminology. So it's an active conversation and um, there's no real clear answers, but we did make some decisions, which I'll get to. So, the first question here, what words and phrasing do you currently use when referring to the continuous monitoring stations that are distributed throughout the Delaware River Basin? So you can see here this word cloud, and we see that mayfly is very commonly used. And that refers to the mayfly data logger, but a lot of folks really like to refer to the stations as uh, mayfly stations and refer to the network as the mayfly network so on and so forth. And that seems to in part be because Mayfly is easy to say and it's descriptive, um, but 
The Stroud Center's uh, official terminology is more geared towards Enviro DIY because Mayfly technically, as far as the Stroud Center has been envisioning it, refers to just the Mayfly data logger. Now folks do use the Enviro DIY uh, name, but it seems a little more, it just doesn't flow quite as well. Um, so it's good feedback and there's a lot of other, you know, sensor station is another term that is often used. Data logger is often used. Um, so these terms definitely get thrown around and we're certainly not trying to uh, micromanage how folks are referring to these um, things, in, you know, in their own work. Um, but we just want to make sure that we're clear about how the Stroud Center is using the terminology and we wanted to get feedback on how folks are using it and that what did indeed uh, um, influence internal decision making or non decision making as we'll see. Um, next question, do you have suggestions for what this group of stations and other monitoring activities could be called. So a lot of different ideas about um, um, or thoughts on uh, kind of what this monitoring network could be could be called. I mean, right now it's really just a network of continuous monitoring stations with some side projects that are not continuous data um, spurring off of the Enviro DIY stations. Um, in the longer term, the network may really be um, not as exclusive to Enviro DIY Mayfly stations. Um, so that's sort of what we're trying to get feedback on and, and kind of think about for the longer term as to um, just how we can really refer to this network. And it's a balance between being general enough to, um, to be descriptive and, and encompassing, but specific enough that it's really saying something about the actual network. Um, a lot of folks suggested having Stroud in the name so, um, to distinguish it from other monitoring efforts that are going on in the Delaware Basin. Um, certainly there's Enviro DIY kind of in there and Mayfly in there. Um, and water quality, another uh, key term being uh, used there and some interesting suggestions like pulse and uh, Stroud sense and having some um, sort of kind of catch phrase type words. And this comment I thought was, thought was interesting. Uh, environmental work needs to rethink language, not that it should be advertising or, or sloganeering, but sharper, less encumbered. Um, and I think that is uh, some of the challenge that uh, we all have in communicating what we're doing um, and what this network really is. We all know it's a network of these stations, but moving forward, there's, there's a lot of different groups that are kind of spinning off um, other monitoring efforts off of these stations. And, um, you know, we're starting to develop protocols that, that go outside of the continuous data and look at longitudinal sampling and look at other types of sampling that are not Enviro DIY. So um, still sort of in this pilot phase of developing a uh, community or citizen science uh, monitoring network uh, from the uh, Stroud Center. So this was the question about these specific terms. Um, what words and phrasing do you currently use in referring to watershed monitoring efforts done by watershed groups and volunteers? So the three choices here were citizen science, community science, and volunteer monitoring. Um, volunteer monitoring was sort of the historic term. I mean, that's been around longer than citizen science, certainly been around longer or more prominently around, um, you know, than, than those two terms. Volunteer monitoring, uh, EPA did a volunteer uh, monitoring guidance document. I think it came out back in the 80s or maybe it was the 90s. Um, then citizen science has been the prominent term for the last decade or so, I guess. Um, but more recently, community science is being is replacing citizen science. And you can see here that um, it's still among the folks that filled out the, the survey, it still is kind of the, the least used term. 
Um, and that makes sense because it really is just kind of a, a more of a recent discussion. And it is related to the DEI, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice issues um, related to what does citizen mean? And in the US, citizen really does is kind of a weighted term where it seems to imply legal status. There's certainly conversations um, more broadly internationally where citizen is used to mean global citizen. But in this country, it, it, it um, implies something about legal status. And so here's just a, uh, another uh, word cloud showing some of this uh, information. Um, for the last question, if you had your choice, what do you think is the best, most descriptive terminology to describe this type of work? And you see volunteer and citizen, citizen community. Certainly people are starting to use community more. Um, there's, this was a quote, uh, I think a pretty descriptive quote of the issue that we're really facing with this terminology from one of the survey participants. And I'll read it. Um, it's pretty small there. I think volunteer monitoring fell out of favor, quote unquote, volunteer monitoring fell out of, fell out of favor because citizen science, quote unquote, was a sexier alternative, but the use of the word citizen is problematic in itself, as I mentioned, because of the, the legal connotations. It is generally accepted that the terms above mean different things where citizen science is top down and volunteer monitoring is bottom up. We typically say community water monitoring. So that's an interesting phrasing to encompass both ideas. And then this uh, survey participant points out this article in Science. Um, and this is a well-distributed article at this point uh, by Cooper, a uh, uh, professor at NC State, who's kind of prominent in the citizen science realm of things, uh, published this article with a, with a lot of other art, uh, authors. And um, they discuss this uh, problem with, with terminology. So I'm not going to get into that, but there's certainly arguments on both sides. Feel free to um, check that article out. Um, I, I don't think the entire article is, is available um, online. If you want the whole article, feel free to reach out to me for that. Um, and so the results of this uh, monitoring and CSI terminology survey are here. Um, so as, as far as Stroud's kind of current decisions on how we're going to go present this terminology. So for the general work, we are switching to community science. Um, it's, that seems the most um, applicable at this point and the most appropriate, considering that citizen is kind of an exclusion, ex exclusionary um, term. And uh, volunteer, also the word itself doesn't really include professionals, which are part of community science efforts generally. Um, it's as far as you know, this effort that we're involved in, um, it's a mix of all the way from full-time professionals to full-time volunteers and everything in between. Um, and then um, the current network of these continuous stations, um, we are sticking with <laughs> calling it Enviro DIY in the Delaware River Basin or Enviro DIY in the DRB, which is sort of what um, I kind of have defaulted to in my communications with you all in emails and such. And that is in part just because this is still a kind of a pilot type project and there's, we don't really have a consensus yet as to what it really is gonna evolve into. Um, you know, possibly because, you know, this already, already is kind of evolving beyond just continuous stations, beyond the Enviro DIY continuous stations. So it may end up being a uh, more broadly um, comprehensive uh, network uh, where Enviro DIY is just under a broader umbrella. Okay, so we appreciate, certainly appreciate everyone's contributing to that, to that. We really got good response and we're going to continue using the feedback on that survey because 
we really appreciated some of the comments and I think those are going to be good to go back to to just uh, see how people are thinking about some of these uh, concepts. Okay, so moving on to the salt in the tap water in tap water survey. Um, these are the instructions. I'm certainly not going to go through all these here, but um, basically what this was was a uh, online survey where, well, not online, I sent it out online and then folks can take those directions and do this essentially. Stick a meter in a uh, cup of water from your tap and also take a chloride strip and put that in the same water and get a reading of chloride levels. This is the most important part of this. If folks have a conductivity meter, you can certainly do that along with it, but the most important part is to do the chloride strip measurement. Um, most groups have conductivity meters, so uh, if you wanna participate, look into getting a conductivity meter from a local group. Um, if you want chloride strips, be in touch with the Stroud Center with me, um, and I can send you a strip or two just by mail. Um, Isaac Walton League also is uh, doing a uh, salt watch, and as most folks know, they send out strips. I'm not sure if they're sending strips out all year long or not, but um, I have a final slide to talk a little more about that. Let me get into the results here. So this survey is ongoing. These are just preliminary results. We'll do this survey uh, probably for a while here because you can do it all year long. Um, so a few things to note in this graph here. Um, we have chloride on the y-axis. We have an approximate sodium level on the other y-axis here. Um, EPA regulation for uh, drinking water is for sodium for salt diets. So EPA low salt diet threshold for sodium is 20 milligrams per liter. That equates to about 31 milligrams per liter of chloride. Now that is you know, an approximation because there's certainly other than NACL, there's certainly other potential sources of um, sodium and chloride. But presumably the major source is um, NACL. So this seems to be a reasonable estimate. So we can see here that uh, almost half of the uh, tap water samples that have been collected exceed this threshold, this EPA threshold for low salt diets. Um, <clears throat> one thing to note here, there were a number of, resu of uh, results from the strips that were below the 32 milligrams per liter um, uh, threshold in uh, detection for these strips. So uh, I put these at 16 milligrams per liter, so they could be a little higher than that or they could be lower, but I just kind of put it in the middle of that as a default. So that's why these are all the same number here. Um, <clears throat> but what you can see is that most, most of those low levels are in private wells. We get in here two public water systems, and the private well here, private well here, getting a little more, private well here, getting a little more, and then one private well here with the highest chloride level all the way up to almost 100 milligrams per liter. Um, and then the majority of the public water system uh, results exceed, in fact, all but two of the public water um, results exceed the low sodium criterion. So very interesting to see. Again, these are preliminary results. Um, but these results do seem to confirm what some other studies have been showing, such as this study from the Philly area that just came out by Cruz et al. Um, and you can see it is broken up between Philly and Philly suburbs. So we've got Pottstown, Havertown, and Philadelphia. We have sodium. 
and chloride. You can see for sodium 20 milligrams, you can see that almost all results here are, ex are near or exceeding that level, especially in all of them in Philadelphia exceed that, and most of Havertown and some of Pottstown. Same for chloride. Um, as you would expect, they're very closely correlated because of NaCl being the most prominent source of those. Um, so again, uh, feel free to look up that study. And um, I think that one is entirely uh, publicly available. If you need help finding that, want to look into it a little more, feel free to be in touch with me and I can send that to you. But that's a very interesting study and it really kind of sounds an alarm on this increasing issue of freshwater salinization. It's everywhere. It's in streams and rivers and it's in drinking water. And one interesting thing that they showed in that study in these <clears throat> public water supplies, especially in Philadelphia, was that salt increased in public water supply during storms, during winter storms. So as road salt is flushing into the streams and that water is being taken back out of the streams and rivers, well out of the school kill in the Delaware, basically, um, and being uh, cleaned up and sent out to homes, it has higher salt in it during the winter and especially right after storms. Um, so, and, and they give estimates on extra salt intake just by drinking water and their results are um, pretty outstanding where there was like up to 30% increase in salt intake um, just based on drinking water. So um, pretty interesting and somewhat alarming stuff. So as I mentioned, this survey is going to continue indefinitely. We're going to just see how it goes, see how, um, see how much we get for results. Um, so if, and as we know, uh, you know, once the salt is out there, it isn't, doesn't get attenuated. It doesn't get used up and disappear. It stays around. So it's in the ground and it's in the groundwater and it's in the drinking water. So it, as it, 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 once it's in the groundwater, that's what, that's what feeds the streams and rivers. So once it's in the groundwater, then it's there. And um, you know, it's there all year long. So it makes sense to do this, to do this survey uh, outside of winter months. So uh, feel free to be in touch if you'd like to participate and don't have chloride strips. I'll, I'm happy to send those. And um, you know uh, those conductivity meters are about uh, 50 bucks. They measure conductivity and temperature. Um, so talk to your local group and see about borrowing one of those or even acquiring some. And just feel free to reach out as needed if you need um, guidance or assistance on any of that. Okay, so moving on um, to, and I see we have quite a few questions in the chat. I'll, I'll just keep going and we can address those once we're through here. Um, as I mentioned, um, there is a subset of groups, mostly in urban areas, that uh, collected, were collecting grab samples this winter and doing chloride test strip measurements and doing conductivity measurements, either with their stations or with uh, these uh, types of handheld meters. Okay, these are very incomplete results. These are really just one or two of the first grab samples that we got in um, from the first storm in the winter. Um, but we can see that there's quite a bit of stuff happening. These are not necessarily peaks that these streams got to. These are just when the, when the streams were um, receiving some level of salt input um, during or after storms as those uh, road salts were flushing into the streams. And you can see that quite a few of those stations uh, those streams were exceeding this EPA acute criterion. So this is, you know, there's a 230 milligram per liter criterion, which is the chronic level, which is 
pretty is already pretty high. As we know, 50 to 100 or so is being shown to be detrimental to aquatic life as well. Nonetheless, EPA criterion is 230. That was set back in the 80s, as well as this one was too. This is the Q criterion. So four hours at this level, and it is considered acutely, acutely toxic to organisms. So these stations, you can pretty much guarantee that the aquatic life is being hammered during these um, and is being harmed, I should say more accurately, um, during these winter salt flush events. So I'm gonna go and zoom in on these sites, which the, these are some, these are generally less urban sites. You can see here this penny pack site. This is just one sample. They exceeded uh, the acute criterion. But some of these, some of these sites um, are not quite at the acute criterion, but this one, for instance, is in a very urban area. And this was just the first sample that they acquired, which wasn't even close to the peak. Um, we have since found that this station, Ryan, at uh, TTF, Tukani Tukoni Frankfurt watershed, um, <clears throat> is finding levels at both of these, both the stations at this um, stream to be approaching and, ex and far exceeding uh, salt levels of the ocean. Um, and that is the more stations that go out on these types of urban streams, the more we're finding that these ocean water level levels <laughs> of salt are not actually that uncommon in these streams, especially headwater streams that are in urban areas. So you can guarantee that when those salt levels are getting um, that high, it is severe damage to aquatic life. And you can see alongside here, I didn't mention in this previous slide, I can go back. That's not let me go back here. There we go. Um, you can see base flow here in blue is way lower. And yet base flow in these streams, you can see how low this is. And yet in this stream, for instance, that is the base flow is still uh, very high and is actually base flow is exceeding the uh, EPA chronic criterion. So we'll, we'll get into base flow uh, salt levels at some later point in time in one of these meetings as we get results back from our other um, more comprehensive chemistry sampling. But you can see here a lot of these streams, even though these are not necessarily peak salt levels, you can see that they're far exceeding base flow levels, which again are very likely um, still above, well above, multiple times higher than natural salt levels. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, these are just preliminary results. We'll uh, be presenting the full results at a later date. And that concludes the survey updates. Um, and I Yes, Shannon, if you want to do your five to 10 minute technology updates, we can do that and then we can get into discussion. And I will stop share for now. All right. Uh, thanks, Dave. Um, well, my first, uh, well, I have a list of uh, brief technology updates, but I guess the first one I can mention that is related to what you just talked about is uh, CTD sensors, which are the main sensors that we use for all of those um, chloride monitoring graphs that they've just showed there. Um, they use a sensor from a company called uh, Meter Group, uh, and the model number is, is called the Hydros 21, and it's the little sensor that gives you conductivity, temperature, and depth. And we've been using those for um, probably seven or eight years now, nine years. We were some of the first people in the country to start using their prototypes many years ago. Um, and they've gone through different versions of the hardware in the past few years. The, the version that's on all of the existing Enviro DIY stations all around the, the DRB for the last few years has been the um, what they call generation one sensor. And 
they had to redesign their sensors uh, recently for the same reason we had to design, redesign the Mayfly was a lot of uh, semiconductor components have become uh, hard to find or discontinued by manufacturers and all that. So uh, they have been working for the past couple of years to uh, redesign and retest and uh, recertify their their sensors and the generation two sensors are supposedly coming out very soon i believe uh there's a handful of people here in this meeting who have purchased them for the upcoming workshop we're having next month and they were told by meter group that they'll be receiving those new generation two ctd sensors um, as soon as they're ready to ship they're not ready right now but they um, we'll be uh, um, shipping them soon enough that everyone will have them in April for that workshop. So that's some exciting news there is that the, um, the new more robust and um, uh, hopefully more accurate, uh, it, it's a fairly accurate sensor to begin with, but we've had issues in the past of, of um, issues with either nicking of the cables or uh, sensors getting hit by debris and other things causing them to fail a lot sooner than we would like. So we're hoping this new version is going to be a little more rugged and uh, and be a better long-term solution for our CTD monitoring uh, stations that are out there. So that's some exciting news for anyone who has purchased one recently or is thinking about buying a new one. Um, and then moving forward, if anyone has a station that's part of our DRB uh, network, that if your uh, existing CTD station if the cable gets chewed or stolen or hit by a rock or washed away in a flood or whatever, and your station needs to be replaced, or at least your CTDs needs to be replaced, that uh, people will be receiving those new Generation 2 models on their stations um, moving forward. So that's all really good news there. And as I just mentioned, the, uh, the Mayfly um, version 1.1, which is the slightly more improved version of the 1.0 that we released a couple of months ago uh, has been released as of March 10th, which was about a week ago, a week ago today. So they're available in the Enviro DIY shop on our website in quantities of five. You can also buy them in the um, like a starter kit configuration or the full monitoring kit station where you get uh, uh, just well, one single one there, but you get the Pelican case with all of the mounting brackets and accessories that go in a full station. So those are available on our website uh, for as long as they're able to stay in stock, and we will continue to have more um, produced um, and, and keeping in stock. And they're not currently available on Amazon, but we're hoping to do that. There's some issues with the Amazon uh, product listings in their inventory system that we're trying to resolve, but we will have single quantities of mayflies and, and starter kits and, and sell boards available on Amazon uh, fairly soon if we can resolve those issues. So they're not on there now. If you go to search for them, you won't see them, but we haven't removed them and we do continue to uh, plan to sell them on Amazon. We just uh, can't do it right now, but, but hopefully those will be up soon. Um, another sensor-related item is the uh, turbidity sensors. Um, a lot of people are probably aware that the uh, turbidity sensors we've been using on Enviro DIY stations were made by Campbell Scientific uh, as an OBS sensor. They were discontinued back uh, in 2020, and uh, they've come out with a new version of a, of a turbidity sensor. Uh, we still have we have a couple of those, and we're still working on getting those um, uh, field uh, kind of field measurement. Uh, um, evaluations done with that, plus uh, one other uh, turbidity sensor. So we're, we're tweaking the code for the mayflies to talk to those sensors and making sure that those sensors are performing properly in the field. And once we make the proper assessment of the, having the right uh, code and hardware and mounting situation, then we'll be able to share with everyone uh, the, the, the solution moving forward for, for those sensors. So if your station uh, doesn't have turbidity and you want to add it later, or you were thinking of building a new station that might have turbidity on it, we don't have a recommended turbidity um, kind of uh, configuration to, to publicize just yet, but hopefully soon we will have the results of the, those tests that we can share with people who want to have turbidity on their stations. Uh, and the last thing to make a quick note of is daylight savings time happened a couple of earlier this week on Sunday. If you haven't been to monitor my watershed lately, uh, but you might be looking soon, you may be a little confused um, about the time thing because every every spring we usually get a few emails from people who 
wonder why the data on monitor my watershed is an hour behind because they think maybe their station is not transmitting on time or something. But um, just keep in mind that monitor my watershed does not jump forward for springtime. Therefore, it doesn't also fall back in the fall. So right now it's 318 here in the East Coast. If you go to monitor my watershed, the most recent uh, transmission from your station will show 215 PM because they transmit every five minutes on a five minute interval. And 215 is what the Eastern Standard Time is right now, but we are in Eastern Daylight Time at 318. So just keep in mind, if you look at your computer time or the time on your cell phone or the clock on the wall right now, and you wonder why Monitor My Watershed shows your station being an hour behind, that's not a problem, that's not a bug, that's just the database doesn't jump forward. If it did, we would have a big gap in the database of an hour every spring. And then in the fall, when you fall back, you would actually have overlapping data for a, a one hour period. And you can't really do that with data. So with time series data, you've got to keep the clocks consistent. Um, we actually transmit the data in GMT time, which is um, you know UTC or GMT. So the time it is in England right now. Um, and then we offset it by four or five, six hours, depending on where you are in the US. But that's all kind of taken care of behind the scenes. So the main thing is on monitor my watershed time is displayed in your local time, um, which will be adjusted, but the logger isn't. So just keep that in mind that it's not a problem with your logger. It's just the way the website works uh, this time of year. And that's all I got. Thanks, Dave. Awesome. Thank you, Shannon. Um, all right, so we have uh, about 10 minutes left and we have a number of questions. Um, while Shannon was speaking, I was writing down some of the questions that we have in the chat. So I'm just gonna run through those. Um, Edie, Edie asked about uh, chloride limit for trout. Um, as we know, trout are sort of evolutionary, evolutionarily um, kind of set up to uh, kind of tolerate salt a little better than some organisms. Salt, uh, uh, trout, um, some, some go to the ocean and come back. Um, brook trout, brown trout, rainbow trout, all those have um, uh, been doing that for lots and lots of years in some, in some situations. So they are set up to uh, be a little more tolerant of salt than the bugs and stuff like that that are just exclusively uh, to fresh water. So Edie, I don't know, uh, I I'm guessing that salt levels, and I don't have this at the front of my mind, but I'm guessing salt levels are the worst uh, for trout in terms of um, eggs and fry and such. So um, I would probably look into it that way and sort of focus in on that. Cause I think once they're adults, they, they're able to tolerate. That's why you see brown trout in cold urban streams. Um, they, they can do fairly well in cold urban streams that have relatively high salt content. Um, but I think, it, it, if I'm, I think if I'm remembering correctly, I haven't looked into this in a while, so it's not real fresh in my mind, but um, I think the biggest impact is probably on, um, you know, during the reproduction process. Um, so moving on, um, Carol was asking about community science, uh, citizen science, so on. Carol, um, to my understanding, uh, community science is not just something that, you know, is being moved to locally. It, it's kind of more, a, more a broader movement to, to that terminology because of the issues surrounding the use of citizen um, particularly as I understand it in the United States, um, just because of how that term is used here. Um, but feel free to, there's a lot of articles and Carol, I can certainly share those. And if anyone else wants uh, more detailed uh, kind of information on that type of conversation, there's been a lot of different articles that have come out uh, in recent years about these terminology questions. So I'm happy to share those with you if, if you like. 
Yeah, I just want to add, I mean, my point was sure. that it needs to be consistent with the international community. Citizen may have an issue in our country, but we want terminology to mean the same thing across studies. That's I know, I know. And that's, and I think that that is that that is part of what Cooper and co-authors uh, talk about in that in that um, article shown earlier, um, is that exact uh, topic, Carol. So it's, you know, I don't know if there's any super clear ways to go about this, but it's it's an ongoing discussion. And um, CSI is what some people are using to just kind of civic society. Civic science is also a term that some folks have used. So C can possibly, um, you know, be used for to represent any of those. So um, Jim. Jim Moore asked about um, if all if the well samples that were low were all from different well for, were all from one well or um, different wells. All those data that I showed, Jim, are all from different from different um, from different wells. So if I go back here. Um, These are all different sites. So these are all presumably wells that are in non-urban areas. And then we're getting into wells here that are most likely in areas that are more closely associated with roads and developments. It's great, thanks Dave. Sure, Jim. Um, and then Grace is, uh, asking about where the data for all the wells, for all the, uh, the locations of these wells. Um, Grace, if you uh, do the survey, when you submit, you'll re receive a return email and you can access all the data. So the data are totally available. All the data are available to anyone that does the survey. Um, you don't have to, I can certainly send you the spreadsheet um, of the results if you want, but if you fill out the survey, you'll have uh, immediate access to all of the data via a Google spreadsheet, which, in, which will include the address. Um, and then uh, Edie asks, um, how do you get chloride from the Enviro DIY stations? Um, well, that is not actually um, possible to get direct chloride measurement. Um, instead, what we do is collect uh, chloride measurements at different conductivity levels and then develop a rating curve so that you have an equation that characterizes that relationship between conductivity and chloride for a particular stream. And then once you have that equation, you can apply that equation to the continuous conductivity data, which will then transform the conductivity data to an estimated chloride level, chloride uh, 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 data point. So uh, Edie and others, if you want a detailed description of that, you can simply go to, and I'll just go ahead and navigate to that. Um, we just go to our resources page here. And then you just go down to the user group meetings. So here we are at our, at our meetings and you just go to uh, the November meeting in which we discuss all of that type of stuff. So you develop a rating curve and then you can convert your conductivity data to chloride. You don't have to convert it all. You can just, once you have that relationship where you know your general ratio of conductivity to chloride, then if you get a conductivity number that you're interested in, some high number, then you kind of have a general idea of what the chloride is gonna be. So you can access that uh, presentation here and the video here, okay? So um, that is all the questions that were in the chat before I started. Let's see what else is here now. Rachel, Shannon, please chime in if there's any um, thing I missed. Uh, oh, and uh, 
Krista, thank you. Um, everyone note in the chat um, that Krista posted links to both of those uh, articles that were mentioned. And, and she also put in the Kaushal article on the um, on overall freshwater salinization syndrome. So check the chat for those links and you can access the those papers that way. Um, so Tom is asking a uh, question for Shannon. Are there new CTD sensors cleaned the same way as the current sensors? Are they as delicate? Great question, Tom. Shannon, do you want to reply to that? Um, I can say that they are not as delicate. So they, they have a totally different pressure monitoring system in them. So they will hold up better. Um, we have a couple of their prototypes, but we don't have the final production version. So I have not seen one in person yet to comment on that, but we should be getting some soon. So uh, once we do get them and uh, as they start to roll out, we can uh, update our cleaning uh, procedure uh, manuals that we put out for people. There may be a new brush that we would recommend for cleaning or uh, some, some new... Uh, type of procedure that we would recommend people use with that. The hard part is making sure that the users in the field recognize whether they have the new version or the old version. So we have to be very clear that, um, that we're not gonna go update every CTD just because there's a new version out. If, you're, if your current one breaks, then you'll get a new one, but the old ones, there's nothing wrong with them. They will continue to stay out there until, uh, until they need to, to be replaced. But uh, from what we can tell, it should be uh, a more rugged version, but yeah, cleaning procedures will be uh, totally different with this new version. Uh, Shannon, question, does the new Gen 2 does have a separate uh, pressure reference? So when Beaver chews through the cable, it's repairable? Um, I've been told that the, yeah, the, the vent tube in the new Gen 2 cable it has a separate small ventilated tube inside the cable with the electrical wires. Whereas on the previous version, what everyone had was, it was just the airspace in the, in the jacket of the cable that provided that atmospheric reference. So that's why an, even a mouse chewing on the, on the wire anywhere along the cable, or if it got nicked by debris during a flood, that's why the pressure would go bad and we had to throw out perfectly good sensors because the jacket got messed up. The new sensors have a totally different pressure monitoring system, but they also have a different, uh, cable and a different cable jacket with a vent tube in it. So overall, the sensor body is more rugged and the cable is going to be more rugged. So it should make the, uh, the sensor lifetime much longer. So we're really looking forward to that. Well, OK, thanks. Yeah, I, I spent a lot of time trying to evacuate the old cable. And uh, no, it, you told me it wouldn't work and indeed it didn't. So yep. glad yeah, we had a separate tube for the vent. Yeah, we tried it too and, and, and never had luck. And I was glad that you tried it also so that when other people have tried to, to reuse a, a, a damaged sensor, we said, well, we tried it and someone else tried a, a whole lot of different things to make it work. And, and just there was really no easy way to salvage an old sensor. So um, we're really hoping that this new one's going to sell, solve a lot of those issues for us. So it should, should, be, uh, should be exciting uh, starting next month when they come out. Thank you. Shannon, are the are the two sensors, the new and the old, uh, plug for plug compatible? Yeah, the uh, the new ones have a black cable on them, uh, so they'll look different, which is actually kind of nice. The cables will blend in better with the environment. That's one of the big requests that a lot of people get when we install a station. Is well, why, what you know the sensors kind of camouflage the the station. Everything blends in nicely, except for this bright red cable. Um, so it'll be nice that you have a black cable, so it will look a little nicer but it has the same end on it, same electronics, same communications to talk to it. And the body of the sensor is the same diameter and length and also it would still mount on the, the rebar with the other sensors with the same sort of hose clamp and all that. So visually it'll look exactly the same, except it'll have a black cable instead of the red one, so. Great, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Um. We are past 3.30. Any uh, final questions or things to address from anyone at this point? Okay. Well, um, 
thank you for attending everyone and um, we'll see you next month. Feel free to be in touch as needed um, and be safe out there. Bye all. Bye, take care.